Your good deeds, the kindness you offer, and the love and goodwill you send out will return to you manifold in various ways. Joseph Murphy He is one of those difficult boss in every workplace. He does everything he wants just because he is related to the CEO. To save the silently enduring subordinates, I decided to stand up, but from the next day, I became the target of harassment. Hey, when do you go to quit? At your age, no one's going to hire you. Looks like a bleak future ahead. Why? You'll become homeless if you get fired. When I defended my subordinate, she took a certain action. Her true identity is. My name is Ryan. I turned 43 this year. My job is neither good nor bad. I work in the HR department of a company and have been promoted to manager. Considering my age, it's a late promotion, but I find my job fulfilling and have no particular complaints. Except for one thing. My only problem is my boss, Alexander. He's a so-called figurehead manager who got in for connections. Arrogant and haughty, he doesn't do much work. He claims others' achievements as his own and blames his failures on his subordinates. As a manager, he should be handling a lot of responsibilities, including managing subordinates and complex tasks. But Alexander never does the troublesome tasks himself, always finding plausible reasons to dump them on someone else. Even during busy periods, he doesn't care. When there's trouble, he's the first to leave. Such a boss can't possibly earn the trust of his subordinates, and he's disliked by everyone. Once, a female employee in our department went on maternity leave, and due to the timing, we couldn't recruit new staff in time and had to hire a contract worker. Then, a young woman called Yvonne joined us. She was articulate, asked questions and took notes when she didn't understand something. When she had free time, she would actively help others, and we all talked about how great it was to have her. But the problem, as always, was Alexander. He who casually practiced sexism, dumped all the menial tasks on Yvonne. Making copies, serving tea, organizing supplies, tasks that weren't part of her contract. When I voiced my concerns, Alexander said, don't talk back to me. She should be grateful to be employed as a contract worker. Women are just meant to handle the menial tasks. Get back to work if you've understood. Yvonne shook her head and stopped me from arguing. It's okay. I'm fine. I'll do my best in everything. She said with a smile and indeed worked hard. I wondered how she could be so dedicated, and it seemed everyone else felt the same. One day, I happened to see female employees chatting in the break room. Yvonne, I'm really sorry about our terrible boss, Alexander. If it gets too hard, feel free to take a break. Ryan understands these things well. No, it's fine. Everyone is so kind to me. I enjoy working here. I see this as a challenge. Just because there's one unpleasant person doesn't mean I want to leave all the kind people here. I've even started to find fulfillment in my work. Seeing Yvonne laugh and strike a victory pose made me feel a bit ashamed. Honestly, I was so fed up with Alexander that I even thought about quitting the company. But seeing her, I felt motivated to persevere a little longer here. Making the workplace enjoyable for young people like Yvonne is also a duty of us older folks. I felt a bit more positive. Things were peaceful for a while, but one day, when I returned from an errand, I heard a familiar yelling. Ah, Alexander is on a rampage again. Entering the department, I realized Yvonne was the target this time. How could you make such a mistake? Are you stupid? Just a contract worker after all. Can't you take responsibility for your work? The usual character assassination. Listening further, it became clear that the mistake wasn't Yvonne's fault at all. It was clearly a result of Alexander's wrong instructions. The mistake was related to the job postings for new hires for the next fiscal year, which contained errors in the number of positions and the monthly salary. 
Though it was a minor error in just two places, it could lead to significant losses. To correct the already published job postings, we would have to request it all over again. Meaning, we'd have to pay double the fee, and even if we got a discount, it would be minimal. Moreover, we would have to re-explain to those who applied based on the initial job posting. Do you think we'd pay a new hire a monthly salary of $4,000 for three positions? What's that about? I said only two. But the voice recorder clearly has you saying to recruit three people with a monthly salary of $4,000, Alexander. Yvonne stood her ground. She had been using a voice recorder as a precaution against Alexander, who often changed his statements. That's her smart move. I thought this would force Alexander to admit his mistake. But I was too optimistic. Voice recorder, are you kidding me? That doesn't erase your mistake. I do like this, cunning woman. Alexander forcefully took the voice recorder from Yvonne and smashed it on the floor. Then, he continued to berate her with nonsensical insults. No one could stop him. Even though it was clear Alexander was at fault, he was hired through nepotism. Besides, he's closely related to President Anderson, so complaining about his tyranny would only lead to our own dismissal. All we could do was silently endure the storm and comfort our battered colleagues. In these times, finding a new job isn't easy, and everyone has their own reasons for working. Even if we wanted to defend someone, we couldn't. That's how it had always been. I've seen many subordinates and colleagues leave because they couldn't bear it anymore. But I had reached my limit. Seeing Yvonne biting her lip, looking down, holding back her tears, I was fed up with making her go through such pain. This is enough. You're the one at fault. It's your mistake. Do you think yelling and pushing the blame onto your subordinates solves everything? As a supervisor, you should naturally take responsibility for your subordinates' mistakes. I was ready to quit anyway. I didn't care if I got fired. But I wanted to help Yvonne, who had rekindled my joy in working, before I left. I stepped in between them, determined. Alexander, who had never been confronted before, was taken aback by my imposing stance. What you're doing is blatant gender discrimination. And as the HR manager, your oppressive attitude is shameful. Have some dignity. I said it. I finally said what I wanted to say. Let whatever happens, happen. Without flinching, I spoke my mind and Alexander, looking for support, found everyone averting their eyes. Times like these reveal the lack of personal connections. Silently. Alexander grabbed his bag and stormed out with heavy footsteps. I'm sorry I couldn't defend you sooner, Yvonne. It wasn't your mistake. As I spoke to her, Yvonne, perhaps feeling relieved, began to cry softly. An older female employee quickly came over to console her. After some commotion in the department, I went around encouraging everyone to get back to work, and gradually, we all returned to our normal routines. As expected, the harassment began the next day. Important communications were not shared with me. I was informed of false meeting times and then meetings were held without me, and important documents were shredded. It was so childish that I initially ignored it, but then it escalated to constant sarcastic remarks whenever he opened his mouth. Hey, Ryan, when do you quit? Where do you plan on reapplying? I doubt there's anywhere that would hire someone like you. You're 43, right? What are you going to do? Your future looks bleak. Going to become homeless if you get fired. He would nag and nag, whispering in my ear. If I didn't react, he would yell at me for ignoring him. It was truly persistent. He called my work cell phone frequently at night, and if I didn't call back, he would become furious. And when I did call back, he wouldn't answer. And he called me at times when people would normally be sleeping, showing his childishness. Then, he started piling on twice the amount of work, resulting in me having to work overtime until the early hours. 
every single day. The workload was so immense that I had to work on weekends just to keep up. I became chronically sleep deprived and was constantly battling drowsiness. Then, one day, I finally made a mistake. Perhaps it was the drowsiness that impaired my ability to make sound judgments. I completely forgot the deadline for documents that needed to be settled, causing inconvenience to the other party. Alexander was thrilled to use this as an opportunity to criticize me publicly. And for that trivial mistake, I was demoted. I had been working with a bring it on attitude, but my spirit finally broke. Was there any reason to continue working hard in this company where such tyranny was allowed just because he was related to President Anderson? Even if I worked hard at the place I was demoted to, there was likely no chance of returning to the main office. It was just a matter of time. I convinced myself of this and resigned on my own terms. I felt a bit down, as if I had let Alexander win, but after a few days of good sleep, I started to feel indifferent. While doing some long overdue housework and watching TV, I heard the familiar name of the company I used to work for. Curious, I looked at the screen and saw the news that my former company had been acquired by a major corporation. I hadn't heard any rumors about it, I was honestly surprised. However, there was something even more surprising. For a moment, on the screen next to the acquiring company's president, Yvonne was sitting. It was just a moment, but I thought it was her. It could have been a mistake, but, well, it doesn't concern me anymore, and I went back to cleaning. One day, I received a call on my cell phone. It was from my former company. Hello, is this Ryan? Yes, this is Ryan. How can I help you? I had already completed all the paperwork for my resignation, so I wondered what they could possibly want now. It's me, Yvonne. Have you found a new job yet? Ah, Yvonne. No, I was thinking of taking it easy for a while. Haven't started looking yet. That's great. Yvonne exclaimed happily over the phone. If it's okay with you, would you consider coming back? Well, that's a tough decision, but why is Yvonne asking this? It was strange that a contract employee like her, and right after the company had been acquired, would call back an employee who had been forced out. When I asked her why, her answer was astonishing. Yvonne was the daughter of the president of the company that had acquired us. Though she was cherished since she was young, she had a strong sense of independence, so she disliked being seen as riding on her parents' coattails and chose to work at a company completely unaffected by her parents' influence. However, unbeknownst to her, her father had been advancing the acquisition, and she ended up working for her parents' company after all. After the acquisition, she became a regular employee, and since it had become her parents' company anyway, she decided to use her influence just this once and went directly to negotiate with her father, President Richardson. She expressed a desire to repay the favor to me and to work under me once again. I've always wanted to handle things on my own. I couldn't help you when Alexander was harassing you because of me. I regret that. It might be too late, but would you work with me again? I appreciate the offer, but I'm disliked by Alexander. I might end up causing trouble for you again. When I declined, she chuckled on the phone. Alexander, he's no longer with us. My father wanted to improve the company's atmosphere and quickly demoted him. Since Alexander hardly did any real work, his transition was swift and he was soon gone. Then, I might take you up on your offer. I'll be returning, but I'll work hard. Will you hire me again, Miss Yvonne? the president's daughter. Ivan, with a voice tinged with anger saying please, stop it, seemed slightly pleased. The rehiring process moved quickly, or rather, my resignation was as if it never happened, and the few days I was gone were considered paid leave. Welcome back, Ryan. We've been waiting for you. We're sorry we couldn't do anything for you, even though you always protected us. Upon returning to the office, Everyone welcomed me warmly, just like before. 
Yvonne also appeared from the crowd. Let me introduce myself again. I'm Yvonne, the president's daughter, but please continue to make good use of me as before. Laughter spilled from those around her as she energetically bowed. Thank you, Yvonne. Because of you, everyone can work comfortably. It's not because of me. It's your popularity, Ryan. I didn't mind being praised. I vowed to make the most of this opportunity and work even harder for the sake of my supportive subordinates. And there was another pleasant surprise. I was soon promoted to department manager. My daughter may cause some trouble, but I ask you a favor. Please don't indulge her, but train her well. There is pressure of president, but that's a separate matter. I have no intention of giving Yvonne special treatment. My only goal is to ensure that everyone can work happily. Your good deeds, the kindness you offer, and the love and goodwill you send out will indeed return to you manifold in various ways. Joseph Murphy It was you after all, wasn't it? Are you working here as a janitor? While cleaning the company's bathroom, I ran into a middle school classmate. Were you able to attend high school? Surely, you didn't drop out, right? So, your highest level of education is high school graduate. That means a full-time position is out of reach for you, isn't it? She said with a snicker, to which I showed her my employee ID. No way, are you kidding? My name is Michael. I was just an ordinary kid, raised by a kind father and a gentle mother in a typical family. My father was reliable, but my mother had a laid-back and somewhat airy demeanor. Yet, to me, they were the best parents and I was happy. That happiness crumbled when I was in the lower grades of elementary school. One day, my father passed away suddenly. Consequently, my mother, who had been a homemaker since getting married and was unfamiliar with working, had to find a job. Indeed, there was life insurance and assets left by my father, but we couldn't solely rely on that. It was meant to be saved for the future, for what may come. For at least the living expenses, my mother took on jobs as a housekeeper and did piecework, raising me single-handedly while tackling unfamiliar tasks. Still a child, there was not much I could do, but I tried to help out where I could, not wanting the household chores to be neglected. I could at least clean the bath or hang the laundry. A little dust in the room didn't seem like a big deal to me. However, my mother thought differently. She came from a background where it was not encouraged for women to have a professional skill. Attending a prestigious girls' school, she was brought up delicately without acquiring any practical skills. Unfamiliar with the world and having never worked a part-time job, my mother faced confusion and hardship following my father's premature death. If it were just her, returning to her parents' house could have been an option, but there was me, a growing boy. Raising a boy in his growing years was not something to be compromised on. Opening a job magazine for the first time, my mother started working in jobs she felt she could do, always appearing tired. I understand now, grown up, that it must have been difficult to support me on her salary alone. During major school events that required a significant sum of money, I saw her asking for financial help from her parents. Seeing my mother like that made me think, to avoid being fired and to quickly find a new job, it was essential to have a reliable skill set and vision. If you have the skills, you can work anywhere. And that qualification should not be something that anyone can easily acquire. It had to be a unique qualification, something only I could do, otherwise its value would diminish. I want a qualification that others can't easily follow. Even as a child, I could feel that. Thus, I spared no effort in what I could do as a child, setting concrete goals to acquire skills before entering society. Thinking such things as a primary school student, I realized I was an unusual child. But having seen my mother struggle without my father, I felt it was necessary, and I was determined. 
A child with a hungry spirit. Indeed interesting. My grandfather used to say that upon seeing me, watching over me with anticipation for my future. As a talented entrepreneur, he didn't mind supporting me, his grandson, as long as I showed my abilities, even though I was a child of his daughter, who had married out. I had been interested in AI and robots even before my father passed away. After my father's death, having a clear future goal, I spent my days studying hard to hold my own against college students and professionals. After graduating from middle school, instead of high school, I went to a technical college where I could learn and gain a lot of knowledge and skills. As I started winning awards in domestic contests and competitions, my grandfather promised minimal support for living expenses until graduation, so I wouldn't struggle. After graduating from technical college, I joined a small company. In the company that was engaged in the field I aspired to, I learned a lot. Surely, just graduating from technical college would have left me naive about the real world. If that were the case, starting a business would surely end in failure. First, I learned about the job content and working system of employees and part-timers at this company. I spent three years learning what to demand from employees, how to manage part-timers, and understanding the overall workflow before resigning. Then, with full preparation, I started my own company. Though it was a small company, I was fortunate to have good employees and managed to run it without any major problems for several years. The company has grown enough to increase the number of employees, but I still feel that I have a long way to go. For those with a skill in hand, every day is a day of study, everything is practice, and every minute and second is an opportunity for improvement. I wanted to grow more and always worked on the front lines, making it my motto. Never forget your beginner's spirit is the motto I live by. Today, too, I arrived at the office an hour before the start of the company. This has been my routine since I started the company polishing the glass doors at the entrance and the floors, and cleaning the toilets to perfection. A clean company improves the atmosphere inside and allows us to start the day feeling good. Of course, everyone cleans their desks and personal items themselves, but cleaning the company's various places is a different story. Since I, the founder, am doing the cleaning, some employees have offered to take turns doing it, but I have declined their offers. This is my personal habit, and it's not something I want to impose on other employees. Jab, no smudges, sparkling clean. I nodded in satisfaction after looking at the toilet mirror. Next, I prepared to clean the floor of the toilet, diluting a solution of sodium hypochlorite in a bucket and soaking the mop in it. After the mop absorbed the diluted solution well, I wrung it out firmly and started polishing the floor. What? While I was scrubbing the floor, I noticed a shadow cast in front of me, indicating someone was standing there. Wondering who it could be, I followed the shadow slowly with my eyes and first saw feet wearing heels. A woman. Indeed, I was cleaning the women's toilet, but I had placed a cleaning in progress sign at the entrance. Could she not have waited? Thinking this, I raised my face further, and the woman standing with her arms crossed and a stern face was glaring at me. Who are you? That cold, disdainful gaze seemed familiar. Have we met before? Where could it be? As I traced my memories back to middle school, it suddenly hit me. Ah, that girl. Surely, her name was... During my middle school years, there was a girl who, for some reason, disliked me. Despite being in different classes for three years, she had been hostile towards me from our first encounter. From the moment we first met during a committee we were both part of, she glared at me, and that continued with ignoring and snide remarks until graduation. Even though we hardly ever saw each other, she would glare at me whenever we passed in the hallway. To this day, I still don't understand why she was hostile towards me. Since I was being ignored, 
I couldn't even question her about it and just went for my middle school years. Her name was Sarah. She, Sarah wasn't like that with everyone. From what I remember, she was kind and considerate to everyone but me. Her appearance was glamorous, not just among classmates, but also with upper and lower classmen. In short, she was popular across all grades. At that time, I was focused on my studies with an eye towards the future, making me a quiet and unnoticeable presence. The Geeky Creep Thinking of further studies despite being poor, how presumptuous. The miserable one whose only merit is studying. She always mocked me when I was alone, taking advantage of those moments. Seeing the sleeve of my uniform frayed, Sarah would say, Oh my, Michael, your uniform sleeve is frayed, and it looks like your shirt underneath is kind of dirty too. She pointed it out in front of everyone, pretending to be kind but actually making fun of me. I didn't care, but some of my classmates seemed to whisper about me. Not that anyone tried to isolate me on purpose, and after that I went on to a technical college, so I don't know what kind of high school student Sarah became. After so much time had passed, I never imagined we would reunite in this way. I wondered who it could be. Since parting ways in middle school, there she was now, looking down at me with disdain as I polished the floor. Those eyes, full of hostility that I had seen so many times before, were still directed straight at me. It was you after all. It's been a while. What, are you employed here as a janitor? Sarah didn't seem interested in my response, continuing with her assumptions. Did you manage to go to high school? Surely you didn't drop out. So, your highest education is high school graduation, right? That means being a full-time employee is out of the question for you. She said, chuckling. Then, changing her expression, Sarah continued. Tothing Kai was excited to transfer to this company, rumored to be the most dynamic at the moment, only to have my mood spoiled just by her presence, the worst. She spat out those words, glaring at me. I thought I lacked the ability to judge people. That's why, although I have set criteria for personnel recruitment, I always leave the final decision to the HR manager. A HR manager I trust. His judgment of people is accurate, and she must be excellent. But, thinking I should at least have glanced through the resumes of newly hired employees, I realized the consequence of my hands-off approach had come back to haunt me here. What's the matter? Can't say anything back, can you? I wish you'd just disappear from my sight. Still continuing her tirade, I slowly straightened up, feigning ignorance. This is my company. What? Sarah's eyes widened in shock at my words, face to face. What did you say? She couldn't believe what I had said. Repeating her question, I decided to explain more clearly. I'm the founder of this company. Cleaning has been a passion of mine since the founding. It's not that I'm a janitor myself. No, that's a lie. It's not. This is to prove. Shaking her head in disbelief, Sarah looked at the employee badge I pulled out of my pocket. It bore the title founder and CEO along with my photo. Certainly not a fake. No way. After staring at the employee badge as if trying to burn a hole through it, Sarah's face turned beet red. Biting her lips, now drawn with a bright shade of lipstick as if about to break, Sarah glared at me silently before storming out of the bathroom. It's about time to start the work day. So, no apology. Considering her attitude, I sighed, wondering about her future conduct. I'd ask the HR manager later which department Sarah was assigned to and then return to my original tasks. At the end of the work day, when I visited the HR manager, I learned that Sarah had submitted her resignation after completing her first day of work. At first, I thought it was merely harassment to trouble me. But Sarah did not show up for work the following day or any day after. 
While questioning her professionalism, I became concerned and asked the HR manager about Sarah's resume and interview, deciding to take action myself. Sarah intended to dedicate herself to this company. Yet, she submitted her resignation on the first day because it was my company, presumably. From the one-sided hostility in middle school to her actions now, I really couldn't fathom why she disliked me to such an extent. According to the HR manager, Sarah was truly excellent, and letting her go like this was not a desirable situation. Wishing to retain her if possible, I decided to confront her directly and headed to her family home as listed on her resume. I immediately took a taxi, provided the address, and set off for Sarah's house. Gazing out the window, I felt a sense of nostalgia. The scenery felt nostalgic. I pondered where I had seen this view before, searching my memory. But the first recollection that came to mind was from my middle school days. And then it hit me why the scenery felt so familiar. Yes, this was the road leading to my grandfather's mansion. By the time I realized I was on the road to my grandfather's house, I had arrived at the address I had given, in front of Sarah's family home. This is the place. The nameplate was written on it, and a single pine branch extended long and horizontally, allowing people to walk underneath at a rare sight of a gate-covered pine in recent times. It's a gate-covered pine, a sight not commonly seen these days. In the back, there's a well-maintained garden, and a splendid house is visible. The surrounding houses had some changes but weren't much different from my memory, confirming my suspicion from inside the taxi. I sent a message to her mobile number, which I got from the HR manager. Thinking it would be rude to visit suddenly, I sent a message and waited for about 10 minutes. Then, I rang the intercom beside the gate. Well, perhaps the message had its effect. No sooner had I thought this than I heard footsteps running from the back, and Sarah burst through the gate with vigor. You, what do you want? Her hair slightly disheveled and forgetting her usual disdainful attitude, she seemed quite shaken. Seeing Sarah like this, I tilted my head slightly. What do you mean? I just came to visit a relative. At my response, Sarah's eyes widened. I hadn't noticed just from the address given by the HR manager. But right in front of Sarah's house was my grandfather's house. Furthermore, Sarah's last name was my mother's maiden name, thus my grandfather's surname. It wasn't a particularly unusual surname, so I hadn't thought much of it until now, but putting together the house's location and a reaction, it was clear we were relatives. Given that we were classmates, Sarah and I must be cousins. Did you know? Sarah asked sullenly at my conclusion. I shook my head lightly. No, I just realized now, coming here to visit. I answered honestly. My mother had married my father despite fierce opposition from her family, almost to the point of disownment. Given that my mother left the house under circumstances close to disownment, and my existence as her son. Our relationship has been delicate, and I hardly ever visit my grandfather's house to this day. However, the fact that they supported me until I graduated from technical college suggests that they don't hate us. However, it seems the rest of the family felt differently, as we never met face to face. Sarah and I are related. The reason for her hostility towards me in middle school if she hated me as a relative, her behavior back then makes sense. Now, you realize, that's just like you, always doing what you want, not caring about how it affects others. Even if someone else suffers because of you, you wouldn't notice, because you're the poor, fatherless kid who thinks getting an award for studying makes you special. That's a joke. Sarah's voice, seemingly overwhelmed by emotion, grew louder. Even though I worked just as hard, I had to get better grades than you, and the awards had to be bigger than yours to be recognized. Hmm. After ranting in one go, Sarah let out a small sigh, seemingly exhausted. Do you know there's someone who, 
no matter how hard they tried, was always compared to you and judged as inferior. Sarah's claim was something I couldn't comprehend. But it was undoubtedly her genuine feelings towards me. Even if it contained hatred or resentment, I was prepared to face the questions I had since middle school today. That's enough, Sarah. Another person's voice cut in. Looking for the source of the voice, I saw a young man with a cane standing at the end of the garden. You've said too much, enough is enough. The young man, who seemed to bear resemblance to Sarah, interjected. Unlike Sarah, he had a gentle expression and smiled at me. It's been a while, though it seems you don't remember me. He appeared to be magnanimous, even towards someone like me who had no recollection of him. Anyway, it's rude to talk here, please come in, we can talk over D. Why? Considering the neighbors are watching, Sarah, lead him inside. Ignoring Sarah's discontent, he treated me as a guest, inviting me into the house. Sarah, looking displeased but unable to object, silently complied and led me to the parlor. A maid, presumably, was instructed to prepare D, and I settled at the table. There, I learned about our past connections. The young man with the cane turned out to be Sarah's twin brother, Brandon. Apparently, when I visited my grandfather's house in the past, the three of us had played together. Having lost my father in elementary school and prioritizing life and future considerations, it seems I have completely forgotten about them. Um, I sort of remember, but also don't. It's understandable you forgot, considering everything you've been through. Brandon forgave me with a laugh. But you know, Grandpa probably saw you as the ideal rival for us at a rage. Everything was compared to you, which is why Sarah saw you as an adversary. I see. Grandpa always said that, being in a more privileged position than you, it was only natural for us to surpass you in achievements. Brandon shared highlighting an extreme viewpoint. Moreover, our parents, aiming to be grandpa's successors, made the situation worse by joining in on this. Brandon tried too hard to meet grandpa's expectations, being diligent and responsible. Sarah. That day, exhausted in both mind and body, Brandon had an accident. He was hit by a car that came out of nowhere without looking at the signals. Sarah's words made me flinch. It was my fault for not paying attention and not managing my health properly. I'm lucky to be able to walk. Brandon said with a laugh, showing no self-pity. Sarah, sitting beside him, frowned more deeply. Sarah blamed Grandpa and resented him, but it seems she couldn't forgive you, who she felt was the reason we were pushed so hard. Every time Grandpa praised you and you acted modestly, it made them underestimate your achievements. We're twins and share a strong bond. After the accident, I was bedridden for a while, causing Sarah a lot of pain, and as a result, she took it out on you, who was unrelated. I wasn't taking it out on you. Sarah is just like this. I'm really sorry. Brandon said, and I nodded in relief, feeling a weight lifted off my shoulders as long-held mysteries were resolved. On my way out, I told Sarah, I'll consider the past few days as a leave of absence, so please, I'd like you to come back to the company. Eh. I heard from the HR manager, there's a lot of expectation placed on you. With that laugh, Sarah huffed and turned away. But I didn't miss the slight relaxation at the corners of her mouth. Brandon also seemed to smile wryly at Sarah's childish behavior. Leaving the sibling's house, I called a taxi and reflected on my life up to this point. The emotions Sarah harbored towards me were, I believe, misplaced anger. However, her words about me just doing what I wanted and not caring if others were unhappy as long as I was fine stung like sharp thorns. I had learned the importance of having a skill from watching my mother struggle, diligently studying for a future. It was for the sake of living looking ahead to the future. But if asked whether I never looked down on my more fortunate classmates, 
I couldn't definitively say number. I had been so focused on myself that I had buried the memories of relatives I spent time with in childhood deep within my memory. Grandpa might have understood my feelings well and deliberately clarified the superiority and inferiority among his grandchildren. Regardless of Grandpa's love for competition and contests, for the first time, I realized that I might have been hurting those around me unknowingly. The fact that I had delegated the entire recruitment process to the HR manager was also because I wasn't facing it myself. It's laughable that such a pathetic man is the CEO. Nonetheless, this unexpected reunion and the disappointment in myself turned out to be a good opportunity to reflect on myself. The motto I live by is never forget your initial resolve. It means, as you become accustomed to things, you tend to become complacent, but you should never forget your original intentions. Despite claiming it as my motto, perhaps the feelings I had when I decided how to live my life have faded. I'm glad to have reunited with Brandon and Sarah today, at this moment. And talking with Brandon reminded me of something. When I stayed at my grandfather's house, they came to visit in the middle of the night, and we lay down on the grass in the large garden, looking up at the night sky together. Despite being in the city, the stars were very visible that night, and the three of us got carried away with excitement. I don't remember what we talked about, but it was a very fun memory. It might be that we will never show innocent smiles like we did back then. Still, I smiled at the thought that it would be nice if the day when we can laugh together again returns.